Good morning. morning. Grab your Bible if you would. We are going to spend our time this morning in Philippians. If you've been with us for the last couple of months, you know that we are going through this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in a little Roman city called Philippi. So you can start flipping there. We're going to hang out in Philippians 3 in just a minute. But before we get there, let me ask you a question this morning. Have any of you ever had like a goal in life? You're like, that took you a minute. That, that concerns me slightly. You had to think about whether you've had a goal. You, you've had a goal? Something that you've like pursued? Not just, not a, not a wish. Let's understand the difference. Not a, not a wish, it would be neat if kind of a thing, but, but a goal, something that you were willing to, to work towards. Have you had one of those? Any of you willing to share what your goal was? I love it right now. You're debating. You're debating. In my Oh, you're going to do it? Oh, you are a brave woman. Getting a master's in nursing. And did you sacrifice for that goal? Yep. That was definitive. That didn't take any time. You worked for that, right? It, it takes work to go after a goal. Is that true? My daughter, for the last couple of months, now if you don't know my, my daughter, she is nothing at all like me. She is very driven and very passionate and very type A. <laughs> okay, she's a little like me. But, but she, she has decided for the last several years that she really loves the piano. I actually uh, sit listening to this fine young man and lead you all and I go, man, someday maybe, that'd be cool. She would probably like that. So she's, she's very driven. And then her piano teacher added fuel to the fire because a couple of months ago she said, you know, Eden, I think you should maybe play in the, in the, in the piano festival at Southeast. And she lit up and got locked in and became very focused on two pieces of piano music. Her routine would be coming home from school and she has a little cubby in our laundry room and hanging up her stuff in the cubby and grabbing her piano books and going and parking her tush on the piano bench and playing the same two songs over and over and over again. Because her goal was to master them. I want to perform these with expert proficiency. Now, she wouldn't use those words, but you could read it in her eyes. That was her objective. She was going to master these two pieces of piano music. And, and she would play, and she would play, and she would play. And if she made a mistake, you'd hear, from the other room. And she'd start over, and she'd play them all again and again and again for months because she wanted to master them before yesterday's piano festival where she had to go sit in front of a judge in a little tiny room and get evaluated on how she did, right? Do you have goals like that, that you give things up for? Because some of the time when she would sit at the piano bench, her brother would come in and say, hey, hey you, you want to play Minecraft? And she would go, uh, no, I, I'm doing piano right now. Or you want to go do this? No, no. I have to practice piano. It was, it was worth sacrificing for this goal, right? Today in Philippians, we're going to jump in at verse 12. So if you haven't already flipped your Bible, do that now. Philippians 3, verse 12. Paul's going to enter into an argument with these words, into his point, with these words. Not that I have already obtained this. All right, hold on. What, what's the this? Well, maybe Paul is talking about, if you keep reading, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already, already perfect. So maybe perfection was his goal. Maybe not. But I press on to make it, there's that it again, my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So what is it that Paul is pressing towards? Is it perfection? 
I don't think so. In fact, I think that this is a continuation of what he says at the tail end of the last section. So if you jump back with me, it's actually a big old long sentence, but we're going to pick it up in the middle at verse 10 when Paul writes, that I may know him, meaning Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. So what is Paul's goal? What is that thing that Paul is after? It is to know Christ and his suffering and his death and to join him in the power of his resurrection. And on that note, Paul says, not that I have already obtained this. I, I haven't already accomplished that. I haven't already attained any of those goals or, already, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, stretching out for the goal is what that phrase means, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the lofty calling or the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he proceeds to tell us that, that those of us who are mature should think like he thinks, that we should have our lives directed at the resurrection, at knowing Christ and looking forward to that day that as his word promises, he will return and the dead will be made alive and all of us will experience a fullness of life as human creatures that we've never experienced before because we'll be placed back into perfect relationship with the Father. That's what Paul says he's pressing towards or straining towards, right? So what about you? What about me? What are we straining toward? Just mastering a couple piano pieces? Is that our life objective? Or are we straining toward what Paul strains toward? Knowing Christ and being united with him in his suffering and death and being part of this resurrection hope that we have. Let those of you who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. So you get the setup here? What's Paul trying to communicate about his own life and about the life of discipleship, of following Jesus that he wants his church to take hold of? It's this simple fact that the Christian life is one of ongoing quest. It is one of following Jesus passionately, purposefully and sacrificially you gave up something sorry you're right in there i don't want to call you out you gave up in fact a lot of somethings probably to get your masters eden gave up a lot to learn a couple of piano pieces we sacrificially give up in this passionate pursuit of what our life's objective is and our life's objective is to be united in christ, to christ in his sufferings and death and somehow to attain the resurrection yeah so how's that working out? You, you do that perfectly? Any of you? You, you do that kind of? You do that miserably? It's tricky, isn't it? I mean, what a load of guilt. Like, I'm not very good at that, Pastor John, and so don't tell me I have to do this because blah. I, I look in the mirror to use Jim's children's message. I know who I am. I know what a mess I am. And, ugh, it's uncomfortable. I don't always press on to that goal. Sometimes I get distracted and disoriented, and I, and I make this about me, right? So what if I don't press on enough? What if, what if I'm not good enough? What if I don't strain forward hard enough? On the heels of this straining, pressing section, Paul drops this little nugget 
in verse 16. If you're tracking with us, this is one of those highlightable verses. Paul says this, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Now, verb tenses matter when you're understanding Scripture. Did you catch that? Paul doesn't say, let us only hold true to what we will obtain or what we might obtain or what we, what we could possibly obtain. No, Paul says, only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Let me see if I can help you understand this a little bit. So, so envision with me Eden, my daughter, who has been working her tail off to try and learn two piano pieces, right? And yesterday morning, we got her up and we fed her breakfast and we made sure she brushed her hair and put on pretty clothes and she looked great and was awesome. And we talked her through the, here's how you relate to the judge and you stand properly and bow and do the whole nine yards, right? We talked her through all those protocols. And then we walked on to the river campus with her with a thousand other kids, all of whom whose parents were saying, you're going to do fine. You're going to do fine. Go, it's okay. You're going to do fine, Right. Because that's what parents do. And, and so we were doing that with our kid. You're going to do fine, babe. We love you whether you do great or whether you get five stars or one star, right? We love you. And with all these parents. So imagine that scene with all of these kids. And you, and you walk in. And you're standing at the door. And there's three kids in front of you playing. And, and one goes in and does this little deal and comes out. And you move up a place in line. And another one goes in and does this little deal. And comes out and you move up in line and now you're next. Can you feel that anxiety? Right? That performance anxiety of, uh, I could feel it yesterday, I'm telling you. I was nervous for her. I may have been more nervous than she was. Imagine that scene and you're next in the door and the door swings open except this time instead of the judge saying, come on in, they walk out and say, wow, you did an awesome job. You get a superior rating, five stars. Now, go on home. How would you feel? It'd be like, what? Like, I, 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 didn't, I didn't play the piece yet. How, 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 could I be, how could I be awesome when you haven't even heard me? I mean, I haven't even sat down on the bench, right? That'd be a little strange, Yeah? Interestingly, that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about the reality of this really weird world that we as followers of Jesus live in. Because in many ways, we're little Eden standing at the door ready to be evaluated. And Christ has already said, you're good. You're good. When I baptized you, I declared you good. I applied my righteousness to you, and it doesn't matter whether you bomb with the little piece of music or whether you nail it, it really doesn't matter. You're good, because I said you're good, right? That's the already. We already have the riches of God's kingdom. We're already heirs to God's kingdom. We already are partners in the promise and the reality that someday Christ will return and we will rise from the dead. That's awesomeness. Yeah? But, 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 but we still got to play the piece of music. You follow that? Like if that happened to Eden, if she stood at the door and the judge came out and said, hey, uh, you're awesome, go home, she would have went, but, but I really want to just play. And yeah, the pressure may have been gone, but, but, but she just wants to make beautiful music, right? She just wants to, wants to go play. I really believe that if that happened to my daughter, she would have gone, well, can I play it anyway? Can, can I, I mean, I, don't evaluate me, but can, can I play it anyway? See, that's the reality. We already have the riches. Paul says what we've already obtained, and yet we still get to sit down at the piano bench, and we still get to play. Now, we're not evaluated on it. That evaluation's already been done, but, but we still get to play. We still have to wake up tomorrow, and we don't yet have the fulfillment of all that God has promised. We hang out here. We're children of the promise, but all of those promises have not yet been fulfilled. And so, so we have to live life kind of in the, in, 
in the anticipation of the fulfillment of the promises that we cling to. Make sense? Tomorrow we have to wake up and, and we get to play. We get to sit at the piano bench and, and we get to play music. One more thing to help you get this, just in case you're as slow as I am, here's the deal. A couple of years ago in my hometown, this very simple man who worked hard his entire life, friend of my father, very close, grew up together, whatever, this man walked into Moto Mart on Main Street in Redbud, Illinois, and he bought a lottery ticket. Now, we're not going to argue about should he or shouldn't he have bought a lottery ticket, but the point is he did, and lo and behold, a couple of days later, you know what he found out? He won a lot of money. Now, I'm not sure you understand me. He won a lot of money. At that time, more money than any other single person had ever won in the lottery. That kind of lot of money. Uh, a lot. So he already had the winning ticket. He was already in, right? Woohoo! I'm rich. Numbers are confirmed. Yeehaw, didn't doctorate. I'm good. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get millions. It's gonna be great. But you know what? It took a couple of weeks or maybe even months for that all to get sorted out with lawyers before he actually experienced that money coming into this wallet. Follow me? So he could, he could make plans about being rich. He could make life goals and objectives and, 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 and draw up blueprints for his house, but he didn't have the cash yet. He knew it was coming. But he didn't have it yet. No, right now, all he could do was make plans and strain forward, press on towards that which was coming. With me? Paul says we strain, we press on to achieve that which is already ours, that which we've already been given in Christ Jesus. That is being tied to Christ, being united with him in his sufferings, and his death and looking forward to the day when he will return and all of his riches will be forever applied to my account. And I'll see them and I'll feel them and I'll experience them firsthand. But for now, you get to look forward with anticipation, knowing that you've already won, you've already been declared righteous, you've already been made acceptable to God, but you strain on because living as a child of the promise is a better way to live. It's always better to seek after God's will than to disregard it and go your own way. So we strain forward to live out this identity that we've been given, even though it hasn't yet been fully realized. Tracking? Y'all with me? Because here comes the gut punch. I want you to get ready for it. If that's our goal as disciples of Jesus, if we can accept this, and I think we do, right? Then, then, then how, how is this and the decisions we make in this, our daily life, how are, how are we straining forward and pressing on towards this goal? Maybe, maybe you missed that, so let me say it again. How are you configuring your life, considering the decisions you make, shaping your worldview in such a way that this goal is in fact your goal, it is your quest, and not just some cute little wish? Like I could wish all day to be able to play the piano, but I'm not going to sit down at the bench and learn it. You with me? How is your life being shaped by that which you declare as your goal? Because guess what? You already have all this. This has already been promised to you. This is God's grace. This is his gift to you and it can't be taken away. But, but our call, says Paul, is to conform our lives to that reality. So how are you doing that on a day in and day out basis? Maybe, by the way, that's, that's really easy for you, or maybe that's gut-wrenchingly hard. I don't know, but I want you to chew on it. 
I want you to wrestle the question, how is my life being conformed by the goal of my life, which is to know Christ and his sufferings and to join him not only in his death, but in his resurrection? How is my life being shaped by that reality? I want you to chew on that this week and look honestly like a mirror, said Mr. Jim, at your life. And maybe commit this to the Lord in prayer and say, God, I'm not very good. Thanks for my identity. Thanks for forgiveness. But, but I'm going to wake up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strain forward. I'm going to press on. I'm not going to be distracted. Yeah? Did I put you all asleep? Are you with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to, uh, to plow through this book, Lord, I just ask... I ask that you continue to stretch us. Lord, it is so easy to get caught up in kind of cultural Christianity and and rarely wrestle these questions, to show up and put in our time and do our thing. and, And Lord, that's not what you desire for us. Your will is better than our will. Your plans for our life are better than our own desires. And so, God, I ask that you stir in us the desire not to question what we already have, but but to be anchored in it, to know that we are your kids. That's not in question. To know that you love us. That's not in question. To know that you have plans for us. That's not in question. But, God, stir us to press on, to strain forward to that which you have already given us. Because you have made us your own. Because you have already given us a new identity. Lord, now transform our lives to look more and more and more like you. God, I thank you for our church, for the ability to to chew on your word together. To wrestle these questions. God, we... um, There are a lot of things in front of us individually and collectively as your church. Lord, allow us not to be afraid, but to press on and strain forward with confidence that you've already made plans and are already putting them into effect. And you have already declared us winners, champions, given us superior ratings because of Because of you, Jesus, we've already been declared righteous and holy and pure. Lord, give us confidence in that and allow us to press forward boldly so that the world around us, people who are currently going to hell, might also come to know you and to join with you and to know of the power of your resurrection. Thank you, God, for your love. We pray this in your name. And the people of God said, Amen.